everyone, and welcome back to my channel. I'm Rebecca Zung, your high conflict resolution attorney, and today we are diving into a really interesting topic, and that is the seven signs that a narcissist is done with you. Sometimes you might be celebrating, sometimes you might be like, oh my God, what the heck is going on? Because you might be really still wanting to be in a relationship with this person but regardless of whether you're doing the discarding or they're doing the discarding you're wondering is this it is this done what's going on here and i've been on both sides of the equation in professional settings where i've been representing the person or i've been helping the person in the work that I do now with my SLAY programs and teaching people now through my certification programs how to spot the signs. And I've also been in the situation in a personal matter through my business partnerships, which was not fun. And I've also seen it in family matters. So I've seen it in a, an array of settings, unfortunately. Or fortunately, because now I get to help you guys in a global way. So stay tuned because you're going to know by the end of this video what the seven signs are that a narcissist is actually done with you. I also address this in my USA Today bestselling book, which is Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. And if you haven't read that, you can definitely pick up a copy of that as well. But before we dive in, if you haven't already subscribed to this channel, make sure that you do that now and turn on that notification bell so that you never miss any of the empowering content that we have here for you on this channel. And if you haven't gotten my Disarm the Narc phrases for disarming narcissists, make sure you get those at disarmthenarc.com also. All right, so we all know how challenging it is to navigate relationships with narcissists, whether it's in your personal life or at work. Understanding when a narcissist is done with you can be a crucial step in your journey to empowerment. So let's get started with that first sign. Sign number one is they become emotionally distant with you. They're known for their intense emotional needs. They need that endless amount of supply. That's their food, it's their lifeblood, it's their oxygen. What's going on? If they start to emotionally withdraw from you, then you might notice that maybe they're getting their needs met somewhere else. Maybe they have a new source of supply somewhere, and that might be a telltale sign that something is really up. They might no longer be asking you for something. You know, maybe it's sex. They're looking to control you the same way. Maybe they're not doing that as much anymore. If they're not interested in what's going on with you as much anymore, then there could be something going on. It can be tough, but recognizing that this is a sign will empower you to figure out what your next step is. What are your next moves? What are you going to do? And start taking control of that situation to figure out what's going to be your strategy. So that's part of my slay method, strategy, leverage, anticipate, and focus on you. So you can start building that leverage. You can start anticipating. You can start focusing on you, your mindset, your, your offensive strategy. So if they're starting to disengage, then that might be a sign. That's number one. Number two is they start devaluing you. They start, in, yeah, they were devaluing you in the first place with that love bomb devaluing and discard phase. But if they start heavily devaluing you even more, I mean, you know they thrive on making you feel in, inferior, but if they are really done with you, it intensifies. You know, there's no more love bombing mixed in as much. It's really just intensifying on the devaluing. It's belittling your achievements completely. It's they don't care about the love bombing more. You can tell because where's that need to make sure that they're worried about 
losing you or you having that tie, mocking your aspirations, belittling your career accomplishments, saying things like, anyone could do what you do. I want you to remember that their words do not define your worth. The next one is that they become dismissive. A narcissist who's done with you might start ignoring your opinions. A lot of times when you are with a narcissist, they do look to you for your opinion. They look to you for your ideas. They can be sort of dependent creatures, even though they can be controlling and they can be, you know, that love bomb to value stage. They can also be sort of emotionally dependent on you. You'll start to notice that doesn't happen. They can start to roll your eyes when you speak. They can actually start to not care what your opinion is about how they dress or how they look anymore. You can start to see that your thoughts don't matter about what's going on with them. That's part of the distancing, but your input on things that they're doing isn't interesting to them anymore. For example, there's something that they're doing at work or something creative that they're up to, or maybe it's a book that they're reading or whatever it is. They're not interested in your opinions. They don't give whatever it is that your thoughts are. They don't give it any consideration, whereas they might have in the past. That's a clear indication that they're not, that they're really no longer valuing you. So, and if you guys are starting to see this, give me an, I see this in the comments. I see this in the comments. And then I want to know what other kinds of things that you're seeing. Let's get a discussion together because if, if you're seeing these sorts of things and other people are starting to see them too, your comments can actually help others. And you guys can start to engage with each other and create that sense of community. That's what we have going on in my Facebook group, Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zong, which I highly encourage that you guys join because when you do that, you guys can also help each other as well. There's a quote from Rumi, which I love, which is set the world on fire, seek those who fan your flame. The fact that you're here, the fact that we're engaging in this in this discussion, the fact that we're all in this place at this time, it's not an accident. You found this channel because you were meant to be here. Your soul is searching to raise your vibrational level because you were meant for more. And that's what's happening. You're awakening right now to the possibilities that you are, and you will be silenced no more. Once you start to realize that your truer, higher self is calling you to be that person that you were meant to be, that you were meant to shine, you cannot go back to what you once were. It's not possible. You can't go back to the smaller version of yourself anymore. And that's okay. Don't apologize for growth. If they're creating distance, it's probably also because you are also growing and discovering the bigger, truer, higher version of yourself too. Remember, radio waves cannot, cannot travel with light waves. And if you are traveling at a higher speed because you're vibrationally growing, then that's who you are. The next one is that they'll start to triangulate. They're going to start to smear. They're going to start to pit other people against each other to maintain control. So when they're done with you, they may start involving other people in conflict. They may even start smearing you. But sometimes if they're a covert narcissist, they might even do it in terms of care. Oh, I'm so concerned about so-and-so. I'm concerned about their drinking. Hmm just really worried about them. They do that to seek to create divisions or to get people on their side to line them up against them. They gossip about, gossip about you to mutual friends or colleagues to try to turn them against you. I'm worried about their mental health. 
Hmm. These are manipulative tactics that they use. So you have to figure out what's going on early on. Keep your eyes open. So the next one is when they start with this triangulation, it could turn into a full-blown smear campaign. It might start off with just a little bit of triangulation. It might turn into a, a full-blown smear campaign where they start to spread rumors about you. They could spread false accusations to people about you, your personal life, that could actually damage you and your credibility. It could damage you at work. It could tarnish your reputation. But here's what I want you to know if this actually happens. The truth will come out. It always does. The cream always rises to the top. Do not think that you have to defend yourself against every little thing. So this is what I always say, never jade. Never justify, argue, defend, or explain. Just pretend like you're reporting the news. Your actions will speak louder than words. If you try to get down into the mud with them, then it's just going to look like two little kids who are arguing. The judge will be like, oh, everybody's wrong. So do not get down into the mud with them. Sign number seven, they actually do discard you. They actually do discard you. They actually do say, I'm done with you. Let's be done. I'm moving out. I found somebody else. I'm in love with someone else. I want a divorce. Or I'm starting a new business. I'm done with this business. Or you're fired. Or whatever it is, depending on what the situation is here. And if this happens, they might actually just do it so badly abruptly end the, the relationship like without warning text message ghost you no explanation no closure it can be incredibly painful but let me tell you something they are doing you a favor it is such a favor rejection is protection when a narcissist leaves you without warning they're doing you a favor move forward toward your healthier life. Now that we've discovered the seven signs in more detail, I want to hear from you. Have you experienced any of these signs with narcissists in your relationships, professionally or personally? Share your thoughts in the comments. Let's engage in a supportive community. Be there for each other. Let's be there for each other. Remember, we are drawing each other to your highest self, your authentic power. That's what this is about. So you're, you've had a narcissist in your life. You've been through the three stages, the love bombing, the devaluing, the discarding. And now you want to know, are they actually done? Am I actually free? How do I know that they're going to come back? Or how can I actually get done with them? I've had to deal with the same thing. I know that the crazy making that they do in your head and, and the spiraling that it causes you. And by the way, if that's where you are right now and you need some self-care, make sure to check out my video on self-care to cope with narcissists because you do need to take care of yourself and you do need to learn how to pivot your brain. You do need to learn how to get out of that thought process, the, 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 what they do to you, that trauma bonding, um, because they really do know how to mess with the neuronal patterns in your brain. And creating new neuronal patterns can be uh, hard to do, but it is certainly not impossible. Many, many, many people have escaped the clutches of narcissists. And if anybody else can do it, you can certainly do it too. You are certainly not alone. And um, there are many, many people who have had to deal with narcissists. The, the, the statistics are actually pretty crazy. I mean, there are something like... Um, like 6% of the population is either a narcissist or displays narcissistic traits. And another 3.3% of the population is actually um, lacks a conscience or has some other pathological disorder. 
which causes them to not have any care uh, or compassion for others, which means we're talking about close to one in 10 of people that we're dealing with in the, on the planet. And if each one of those people narcissistically abuses five people in their lifetimes, we're talking about most all of us on the planet have had to deal with a toxic personality and try to figure out how to get out of this situation. It's a huge percentage of us. And, and by the way, not only are you not alone, the other message that I really want you to get is that narcissists don't attach themselves to you because you have no value. Yes, they devalue you. Yes, they eventually try to make you feel like you're so lucky to be in their presence and, you know, and there, you, you, there's, you know, so, something wrong with you and all of the things that they try to get you to feel. But the bottom line is they only attach themselves to forms of supply that have value. So they attach themselves to you because you have so much value. That's the, the really ironic thing. They love bomb you and then they start devaluing you. And the devalue stage, by the way, is where they're kind of taking back their investment. That love bombing was really just an investment in their uh, mind in order to, you know, start taking out the, um, you know, the deposits start, start actually cashing them in. Okay. So, um, and if you want to know more about the three stages of a narcissistic relationship, the love bomb to value discard, I have a series on that and we'll make sure to drop links to those videos below. You should definitely go check them out. If you're not really familiar with the different stages of a narcissistic relationship, but how do you know when they're done with you? There's only going to be two reasons that they're ever going to be done with you. And the first one is that they are no longer getting any form of supply from you whatsoever. Because as long as they are getting narcissistic supply from you, meaning you're feeding their ego in some way, and most of the time the way you continue to feed their ego is they think that they can come back and intimidate you in some way or make you crazy or make you pay attention to them uh, or make you scared. Uh, all of those reasons are reasons that are great reasons for them to continue to be in your space. Narcissists collect their people for forms of supply and they keep them like in their supply closet for when they may need to pull it out to get more supply. And it, I mean, it's almost like, you know, when you're at the bottom of the peanut butter jar and there's still like a little bit left in there and they're scraping the bottom, if there's even that left to get out of you, to scrape out of you, to squeeze out of you some little form of supply, they're coming back. They're coming back to get it. They still smell it like they like sharks smell blood in the water. And if you think that they are just sharks, like predators, give me a sharks in the comments. So as long as they can come back to you, they still smell that blood in the water like those sharks, they'll come back to you and try to get that supply out of you. So that's number one. So the, the only way that you can get them to stop, by the way, is either creating very steel boundaries, super strong boundaries, or um, going completely no contact. And I understand that some of you can't go completely no contact. Maybe you have children together. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's somebody it's, you know, that you can't get rid of, but you can uh, put down boundaries that allows you to continue to have peace of mind and, and protect yourself from that negative energy seeping into your space and also protects yourself from being triggered because they know how to push your buttons. Narcissists are actually very masterful at reading people. They really do know what it is that will upset you, what it is that will trigger you and get you to be emotional. So by not giving them the supply of letting them see you be emotional, then again, you're cutting off that source of supply. The less supply that you can give them, the more 
peace that you will have in your life because they'll, they, they'll stop coming back, you know, slithering back to, to find their little source of supply if, if, um, if there's no supply to be had from you, okay? So the next reason that they will be done with you is if they found a source of supply that is completely uh, replacing you as a source of supply, or maybe it's a better form of supply. I know in my situation, um, one of the, the narcissists that I had to deal with was in a business setting and that particular person found somebody else that they thought would be a better source of supply for them. And I was like, yes, please, please go find that new source of supply. Goodbye. I mean, and they thought that they were like, you know, making it uh, like I was going to be so upset or whatever. And, and that's the beautiful thing. That's when you know you've really beaten the narcissist, by the way. And if you want to know more about when you've beaten the narcissist, please check out my video on when you've beaten the narcissist. So if they find a source of supply that's gonna be better for them, or they think somehow it like makes them look better, or they can get you know, more value out of that, um, then off they will go. And good riddance, you know, no give backs, right? I mean, the, in, don't be jealous, don't be upset. Just be like, thank God I got that person out of my life because there are plenty of people on this planet, the other nine out of 10, that are way better for you and, and, and actually can lift you up and make you feel, when you're, after you're done being with them, you feel empowered, you feel inspired, you feel good, you feel happy. I mean, if you're with somebody and that person is giving you anxiety all the time, that is not a good person to have in your space. And life is really too short. It just is. You do not need to live with negativity in your space. And that's what I teach you how to do is get out of these relationships, actually negotiate your way out of this relationship so that you can actually end up with an equitable result and move on with your life. So what happens when that narcissist is done with you? So the thing is that narcissists see things in black and white. You're either for them or you're against them. I mean, honestly, when, when things go downhill, you become public enemy number one. Whether it's you doing the discarding or them doing the discarding, you are now public enemy number one. You're taking that supply away from them. So it's going to be this war, all right? So they want to save their ego, all right? So that's what's happening there. They're taking away that supply so they don't want to be exposed. Now becomes this game of war right? So the first thing that they're going to do, if possible, I mean, one of the things that they may do when they're done with you is they might just treat you like a total stranger. So if they, if they see you out in public, they may just like totally ignore you, you know, walk by you like they've never even met you before. Because especially if they think that that's going to really, really hurt you, they know what your Achilles heel is. They know how to hurt you. They know how to get under your skin. They know what your trigger points are. So if they know that that's one of those things that's really going to cause you pain, then that's something that they will definitely do. Completely walk by you, completely treat you like a total stranger. So that's one of the things that a narcissist may do when they are done with you. Another thing that a narcissist may do when they are done with you is treat you with total and absolute disgust, like, and punish you as much as possible. And by the way, this will be even if you did absolutely everything for them gave them everything, gave them your life, showed them absolutely everything, no matter what, whether, whether it was business, whether it was personal, and you're over there going, wow, I did everything for you. What about this? What about that? Look at all this stuff that I did for you. I 
did divorce law for a really long time. And I, I know how many times I sat through conversations with clients who said, I did all of these things for this spouse. I put them through medical school. I supported them through this. I did that. Or even in business, you know, I mean, I know for myself, I was a business partner with a narcissist and I did <laughs> absolutely everything, you know, because narcissists are inherently lazy and it doesn't matter. They will punish you to the ends of the earth and they'll go around and tell everybody that they did everything and that you were horrible to them and they were the victim. They will show complete disgust toward you and they have no shame, no scruples and no conscience about it. They'll put you in jail, whatever it is that they need to do to punish you for it. That's another thing a narcissist will do when they're done with you. Another thing a narcissist will do when they're done with you is act like you destroyed it all and it's all your fault and tell everybody that that was all your fault and that you destroyed everything and then try to make you feel guilty for it. And then the crazy thing is, after they do all of that, then they'll say, but if you want to continue in the relationship, here's how, you know, you can continue to do that. Even after they've done all of this, like horrible stuff toward you. But if you want to continue in the relationship, here's how you can continue to do that. I remember this happened in my business situation. It was like, after all this like horrible stuff, it was like, but here's how you can continue in this relationship. And I was like thinking, I don't even want to see your face ever. Like, I don't even ever want to hear your name. They're so delusional, but yet that's what they say. And by the way, it's during this discard phase that you see the birth of the smear campaign. And sometimes it's even long before the discard phase. And I do have an entire video on how you can shut down the smear campaign. You definitely do want to check that out. Check out that video on how to shut down the smear campaign and put in the comments right now, shut them down because you do want to shut them down. Okay, number four. Number four is they will pretend like they're happy with whoever their new supply is, whoever that is, and they're going to hope that they got better supply or whatever it seems like is perceived to be better supply than you because they want to make it seem like they've moved on and they've moved on to better supply than you. And they're going to pretend like they're so much happier with their next form of supply and try to rub it in your face in any way that they can through their flying monkeys, through social media, through third parties, in whatever way possible, or sending you emails, sending you pictures, sending you texts, through your kids, in whatever way possible to make it seem like they are so much happier without you, or even tell you in person, look at me so much better off and so much happier and in such a better place without you. And then the next thing is just absolutely going after you with everything that they have with full force, full on in every way possible, using the court system, using people themselves, every form of communication, the kids, absolutely everything they've got. Police, whatever they can to punish you, to use their animosity, their disrespect to be as brutal and horrible as possible, to punish you and go after you in every possible way. And so that's the last thing that they'll do. And depending on how malignant and horrible they, do, they are, they may stalk you. I mean, whatever it is that they need to do. Uh, fraudulent charges say that you were a child molester or whatever. I've seen that. 
say that you beat your wife or husband, you know, I mean, just about anything I've seen. So that's the last thing that they may do. That's, you know, super unfortunate. But I mean, if they're a covert narcissist and they want to appear like they're fine, upstanding people in the community, they don't generally tend to go the stalking route or things like that because they don't want to get arrested but they will definitely line up flying monkeys and they will lie to people and things like that i mean they will use gaslighting and they will go as far under the radar as they possibly can they will definitely try to make it look like they are the victim of you a hundred percent they will do that a hundred percent but they will just go about it in a different way. That's for sure. We are going to guide you through the minefield, guide you through the minefield of the tactics that narcissists use to break you, all right? And, you know, I know that you are feeling maybe broken down. You're maybe feeling disempowered. They want you to feel destabilized. They use these tactics to try to control you. And when you go to negotiate with them or try to communicate with them, which is where I come in, I am a negotiations expert. I've, I'm an attorney. I've helped people in many, many different arenas. And uh, if you don't have my brand new book, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and When, definitely go and grab that. But, you know, I want to help you transform in this they 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 launch psychological warfare on you right so they're like these shadowy gladiators they come on charming they start off charming and and they try to break your spirit and one of the weapons that they use is gaslighting all of them use gaslighting uh, is, you know, even covert narcissists, especially covert narcissists, and how that will show up is in many different arenas. It, you know, I in my book, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win, I actually talked about so, so many different forms of gaslighting. When I went to go start writing the chapter, I thought, wow, there are so many different forms of gaslighting that I could actually write an entire book just on gaslighting. I didn't even realize as I started writing about it, how many different forms of gaslighting there are until I started writing about it. And what gaslighting is, is basically a way to make you think that you are crazy. It's it's a way to make you think that your reality is not your reality. What you're seeing is not what you're seeing. What you're hearing is not what you're hearing. What you are feeling is not what you're feeling in any different scenario, whatever it is. So, you know, it might be, we had that conversation. Don't you remember? And you're like, ah, oh, we never had that conversation. Or it might be you're too sensitive. You know, so you're, what you're feeling is not what you're feeling. It might be any way to distort your perception so that you're doubting the ground upon which you stand or the feelings that you're feeling. In any you so that you start to literally doubt yourself. You know, your brain is foggy and you really don't feel like yourself anymore. And it's it's vile and it's venomous. And you know, it's a way to take control of you, take control of you. Because that's what they want to do. Narcissists are people who don't feel good about themselves. Because they don't feel good about themselves, they want to take control of others through these, these methods. They are very fear-based individuals. They're very insecure individuals. And so they 
they use this method and it, you know, it can be in the form of passive aggression or it can be in the form of withholding. You know, it can be in the form of you're looking at a text message that looks like if somebody is being flirtatious, you're reading too much into this. So, you know, it's it's anything that makes you look like you are doubting your reality. And that's what gaslighting is. The next form of psychological warfare tactics, a tactic a narcissist uses to break you is triangulation, where they basically play puppeteer or marionette. You know, they're taking a marionette and they manipulate relationships to create this web or line up armies to isolate you, make you feel bullied, make you feel like you are the only one who feels a certain way. And, you know, as a child, I was bullied. And, it, you know, so this is something that is very triggering for me, that's for sure. And it's, you know, it's to make you feel like you're the only one who thinks this or everyone's going to believe their lies. And it's, you know, to make you feel like you might as well give up because, you, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? You're never going to win. The, the cards are, 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 are stacked against you. So what are you going to do? It's uh, extremely deflating. It's defeating. You know, it's a smear campaign. And you definitely see this in the discard phase. But, you know, many times with covert narcissists, they start seeding this triangulation even long before you even know that it's happening. I mean, they might start saying, oh, I'm so concerned about Johnny, I'm concerned, concerned about his drinking, just worried about him, just worried, just so concerned. And they put it in, in terms of care or concern so that people think that they're such a good person. They're really manipulating. They're really actually smearing. So that's, you know, one a way that they will start triangulating. And another form of tactic that a narcissist will use to break you is projection. They project and cast their own flaws onto you or others in a twisted sort of mirror game to take whatever is going on with them and project it and, and put it onto others. So because they don't want it to reflect back onto them what's going on with them so uh, you know that's another one and then you know and then there's always this love bombing and devaluation cycle as well love bombing devaluation love bomb devaluation which happens throughout a the the cycle of a relationship until you get down into the discard it's the cruel sort of hit of of dopamine and then back into devaluation and then you're craving that hit of dopamine which is a very very powerful powerful craving that it, addiction hit that you are looking for showering you with affection and casting you out down with scorn so which of these have you guys faced? I would love to know. Let me know in the comments. Tell me your tale. Tell me your battles in, your, in the comments. Which story could be your beacon of hope for others? Tell us in the comments below. And picture, you know, this, you know, a client during negotiations has ruthlessly been gaslighted backs twisted until they're doubting their own sanity they're doubting their own reality and then i step in not just as their lawyer but trying to 
help them with their reality, re reminding them of what their reality actually is. We strategize, we document, we ground them in their truth, in their reality, and we triumph. Have you ever felt that grounding of reality sh shake beneath you? And then you needed to find your footing again. Has that ever happened to you? Your insights are so invaluable. Share them below. Share them below. Triangulation can be so disarming. And if you need an ally, you need that ally, and you, you're, but you're suddenly feeling like you're alone, remember that knowledge lies in in power, in, in, in having that, you know, you need to have that power behind you, right? So having that battle plan is so important. That's why I wrote my book, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. That's a battle plan for you. Tactics, spot them, stop, stand strong against these assaults. Facing smear ca campaigns can feel like you are stuck in, in, in quicksand, right? So you need to have the right words. You need to have a lifeline. And I've curated potent phrases for you to disarm any narcissist, leaving them speechless. So if you want to know what they are, get my free phrases for disarming narcissists. You can get them by clicking the link on Disarming Narcissists. Just go to disarmthenarc.com and get them. They're totally free. And that way, if you know, you're know you ever at a loss for words, you'll have them. And, um, and I would love to know which is your favorite, right? Share your favorite phrase with us in the comments. Your wisdom is a torch for so many who are stuck in the dark. All right, let's talk about the five signs that a narcissist is ready to snap. So I teach you about how to negotiate with narcissists. And so one of the ways that I teach you is that you have to create a strategy. You have to have leverage. That leverage means that you have to kind of put pressure on them. And it's that pressure that will finally get them to a place of being able to have a conversation with them so that you can maybe actually get somewhere and have a resolution. So you have to kind of push on them and you have to be really sort of careful about that. And I do teach all of that in my SLAY program, by the way, if you haven't checked that out, you definitely should. And SLAY stands for strategy and leverage and anticipating what they're going to do and focusing on you and your case. So you do want to anticipate what it's going to look like if they are going to snap. So you understand, of course. And they are control freaks. They are super selfish at, to a fault. They don't have the ability to see or understand or what's going on or empathize with other people. They just only feel, you know, things about themselves. And it manifests in different ways. I mean, it really just kind of depends on the type of narcissist you're dealing with. I mean, you can have the overt narcissist. You can have the covert narcissist. I actually have a whole video on the three main types of narcissists, which you can definitely check out if you'd like, but they start to snap when they're not getting their way, when they feel like they're losing control, when they feel like they might be exposed, when they're threatened, if they're criticized, if they're, if they're kind of, they're used to sort of being able to slither their way out of things by projection and deflection and denial and all those things and lying. But if you're starting to close in on them, which is what you need to do, if you want to get them to a place of being able to negotiate with them, they start to feel like, oh, I can't wriggle out of this. I'm, you know, it's like a fish that usually just kind of slides their way out of your hands. But if you just got a good grip on them and you've, you've enclosed them, then they can't go anywhere. And it's, it, that's what happens. And so they feel like there's a blow to their ego. They're losing control and it can trigger 
their narcissistic injury. And sometimes, you know, they don't take it so well. And we're going to talk more about that here. All right. So number one, the first sign that a narcissist is ready to snap is that they start making mistakes. And you'll start to see that they're usually pretty smooth, but they'll start to get desperate and they'll start to make mistakes. They'll start to leave traces behind. You'll start to see them writing things that they shouldn't have, saying things that they shouldn't have, getting sloppy, where it's sort of easy to start putting together the pieces. And that's part of your strategy and your leverage, by the way. And so that's number one. Number two is they they start to desperately rely on all of the things that worked for them in the past. So, you know, that love bombing, the hoovering, their charm, uh, they turn it on even more so. Oh, you know, um, you know, well, I, I always do things for you. You know, they'll, they'll start even doing more. Whatever worked for them in the past to charm their way into your life, they will start laying it on so much thicker in order to, you know, hey, it worked in the past. Let me see if it'll work again. Um, and if they start to see that it's failing, they start to, you know, get sort of desperate. Okay. And so once they're starting to get more desperate, that leads me to number three, which is they get much more outlandish. Like, you know, at the beginning, it's like maybe small mistakes, but what I'm talking about here is just they get really, really outlandish. And a great example of this, by the way, is in the HBO Cinemax series called The Undoing, which stars Hugh Grant. I actually did a whole video on this. You should definitely check it out. It's called The Undoing of a Narcissist. And in that, by the way, spoiler alert, close your ears just for 30 seconds if you don't want to hear what I'm about to say. But in that, Hugh Grant starts to blame his young son for his own actions. And that is so crazy. It was so crazy and so outlandish that the wife figured out what was going on, the wife being played by Nicole Kidman. So really, really great series and especially a great study in a malignant narcissist, by the way. And so, all right, next is um, they become more aggressive, okay? So they, they start making mistakes. Then they start relying on what worked in the past. Then they start to get more and more desperate, more and more outlandish. So if that's not working, they become more aggressive. So this is when they start showing up at your house. They start flooding your email. They start flooding your text messages. They start blaming you. They start attacking you, all kinds of, you know, filth and, and debris coming out of their mouth and being hurled at you, uh, incessant texting, showing up, stalking, they're becoming unglued. And, and so that's the next step. And then you're just over there cool as a cucumber, hopefully, because you've taken my slime program and you know how to behave. So you're just cool as a cucumber and you're just watching them undo themselves. It's like watching a two-year-old have a tantrum because you are in the process of finally shutting them down. And if you are so ready to shut them down, give me a shut them down in the comments right now. All right. You ready for number five? Number five is they've tried all these other things that I've mentioned to you and their narcissistic rage now comes flying out. And when that happens, you're going to see them really start to snap. Um, that's when they just completely undo them their, themselves. The ironic thing is that they love to antagonize you. They love to go do, they love to make you crazy but they just think that they're gonna be able to continue to do that and you're never gonna fight back and you're never gonna be strong and you're never going, you're just gonna to continue to be triggered. They actually don't count on the fact that maybe that won't happen anymore and maybe your fear is gonna disappear. And when that happens, 
you now have all the leverage. You have the power, you have the control, and you are the much stronger one. Let's talk about when that game finally ends for that narcissist. And it does happen. And you guys, there are many of you out there that are thinking it never ends. It just never ends. And it does feel that way sometimes because they're in this thing. And, and I know what happens with you guys, right? You, they, they traumatize you, they use you, they abuse you. And, you know, they start off with this, you know, super charming personality, by the way, and you wouldn't have gotten sucked in had they not been super charming. I mean, come on, you're not stupid. I can't tell you how many people have come through the doors of my office and have said, I'm really smart in, in all these other areas of my life. You know, I mean, people who have been super successful, I got sucked in too. You know, I, I don't think of myself as being like, you know, a loser or anything like that. I mean, I hope not. And, but yet here I am, I got sucked into the whole thing too, because, you know, they're really good at what they do. They're master manipulators. They, they know what to do to suck people in. They prey on people. And by the way, they didn't attach themselves to you because you had so little value. They attached themselves to you because you have so much. They're, they're not trying to suck narcissistic supply out of the people that have no value. Where's the value in that? They want the people that have the value. They want the supply. They're going for the, the juicy thing. You know, you know, think about those lions or the tires or the, pe you know, the, the vultures. Vultures is probably a better thing. I actually like lions and tigers. Let's, let's talk about vultures. So, you know, the vultures, they're looking for the carcasses that actually still have something left on the bones, right? That's what narcissists want too. They, they want something that has some meat on the bones, something that's good, something that has like, you know, something to go for. Okay. So think about that. Even though they come along and they start devaluing you, that's like, the smoke and mirrors thing that they do. They, they come along, you've got value. Then they start shifting it around and make you think that you have none, even though you have all the value. It's like kind of crazy, but it is, it's a whole toxic stew thing that they do. And they really get off on, you know, making themselves feel more powerful over somebody that has a lot of power. I mean, just think like the whole Britney Spears thing, right? I mean, her dad is probably a narcissist and he's like loving the fact that he's got power over somebody who has like this level of celebrity. So therefore she's got some amount of power because she's got this celebrity and he's got power over her, you know, with this conservatorship. So, you know, that's what they do. This whole love bomb to value discard the whole toxic stew in between. So when you're negotiating with them, it feels like it's never going to end. And the more personal it is with the negotiations, the worse that it is because they know how to trigger you and they don't want it to end. And, and here's the, the big mistake that people make going into the negotiations is you think what is it that they want? I'll just give it to them so I can be done with this thing. And the problem with that whole flaw in the thinking, the very big, huge flaw in the thinking is that what they want is not to be done. What they want is to jerk you around. What they want is to manipulate you. What they want is to intimidate you. I mean, you think, oh, maybe they just want me to die, but that's not what they want either because then there would be no more supply left to be had. What they want is for it to keep going. It's like the Barney song that never ends. You know, this is the song that never ends. Uh, they, they want you to constantly feel manipulated. They literally get off on that. And that's why they continuously move goalposts. They'll give you an offer. And even if you take the offer, They'll say, oh, no, the, the offer has changed. The, the, the deal is different now. Oh, I'll take the parts of the deal that, that I like, but not the parts that, you know, I don't like. 
And I have a whole video on that, by the way, if you want to check it out, why narcissists constantly move goalposts, which you can definitely watch if, you, if you'd like. That's why the fees are like four times higher for, you know, litigation when narcissists are involved, you know, average cases without narcissists, or, you know, you can actually settle because there's something that somebody wants and there's like the whole, oh, you can, uh, I'll trade this for that. And you, oh, this sounds good. And, you know, we can actually come to some kind of a conclusion. Oh, that, okay. Yeah. I mean, you can have those kinds of rational conversations when, rational people are involved, but not when narcissists are involved. I mean, I had a client one time, total narcissist, by the way, who would actually say to things to me like, oh, I'd rather pay you than her. Okay. And I used to say to him, this is before I actually knew that he was a narcissist and, you know, understood what was going on, that I was actually a pawn in his little scheme to intimidate and annoy the, the wife. You know, I used to say, hey, you know, I don't need you to help me put my daughter through college. You know, we, we can actually get this thing done. And, and he would do things just to annoy her. Like one time he signed a support check with his left hand, he was right-handed. He signed it with his left hand in crayon with just, you know, his first name, just because he thought it was funny. And of course, that became like the centerpiece of the other side's trial exhibits. And by the way, remember that anything you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit. So that like didn't look so great for my client, by the way. But you know, he didn't even care because he thought it was funny. But that's the kind of thing we're talking about. It goes on forever because now she has to file a motion to compel. And now she has to like, she didn't get her support check because of course the bank didn't cash it. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. It goes on and on the, Bar the Barney song, but there you go. So what worries them? When will it end? When will it end? It will end when they are going to be potentially exposed because what there's a hierarchy of supply and what drives a narcissist is supply. That's it. There's only one thing. However, there are different types of supply for a narcissist. So, you know, think about the vulture. So there might be like a better form of roadkill. So like there might be better roadkill up the road than down here. And so, oh, if there's better roadkill up there, then I might go over there. But hey, there might be still some roadkill left over here. So let me just make sure there's, and I've gotten all the roadkill there is left over here. So if there's a little roadkill left over here, then I'm, I might, you know, make sure I've gotten it all over here. So you know, exposing them or threatening to expose them is the best way to potentially make them feel like, you know what, it ain't worth it being over here anymore. I'd rather move on to the next form of supply. And that's why it's really, really important to develop a strategy. You know, I talk about this in my slay program, strategy, leverage, anticipate, focus on you. That's the only way. S supply is what drives them. And if you don't develop that strategy, you don't have that leverage, you don't anticipate what they're gonna do, you don't focus on you, your case, your position, you ain't gonna get there. But once you do, you will. It uh, will a hundred percent work. It absolutely will. When there's no more supply left to be had on your side of the equation, they will slither on down the road and that game will finally come to an end. But then and only then will it come to an end. That's how it works. That's how it will come to an end. They have to worry that they're going to be exposed or they have to think that there's no more left. There's no more supply left 
to be had because if there's any little like bones to pick and that's why they come back by the way and they you know they, you get that little ping in your dm you get that little thing you get that that little email or that little oh let's see if there's something to be had over there or that you get that little thing to try to trigger you um maybe they they miss a payment or something like that just to see is there is there some supply left to be had over there is there something i can get and a little rise i can have over there because they want to see if they're testing they're testing to see if there's something that they can i can get out of this and if you know that i'm true if you know that these people are total vultures give me a vultures in the comments right now is you know that they are vultures what happens when a narcissist realizes that you are no longer interested and by the way this is what you want to do you want to say goodbye hello goodbye what is going to happen is the narcissist starts off with you know love bombing you and this is whether or not you are in a business relationship or a personal relationship because i was in a business relationship with the nar narcissist and they start off with the charm and the charisma and all of that doesn't last long because they want to get to getting something out of this relationship. They don't want to be putting something into it for very long. They want to get something out of it as fast as possible. You know, they start off with that and then they move into devaluing and then discarding. And then the devaluing and discarding, they, that kind of, and the love bombing, all that sort of is going on for a really long time. But when you're into discarding for good and they start to realize you ain't coming back that's when you become public enemy number one that's when they're like okay if you're not for me then you're against me then you're my enemy and that's when you're going to see that mask start to fall off i mean yes they're going to start to try to love bomb you again for a little while and start to sweet talk you and future fake you and do all the things that they do. But I'm talking about after that. I'm talking about when they realize that all their old stuff isn't working anymore and they realize you're going to be gone for good. That's when old methodologies are, are going to be, okay, I'm going to start to panic now. So these old things aren't working. So now I'm going to have to start to panic and I'm going to start to go a little bit crazy because what am I going to do to protect myself? Because they're afraid that you are going to expose them. So now they're going to want to make sure that they take you down before you can take them down because they, they're worried that you know things about them. So they're going to want to make sure that they tell people things about them. So of course, the first thing you're going to do is start smearing you. During this discard phase, this is where you see the birth of the smear campaign. So this is where they're going to start to line up their flying monkeys. They're going to get other people involved to you know, immediately get on their side. So it could be your children. It could be coworkers, it could be employees, it, you know, whoever it is. But right away, they're going to get people involved to make sure that they line up on their side and against you as fast as possible. They were going to want you to feel like everyone else is lining up on their side and against you. And if it's a covert narcissist, they may have started this long before you even realized that this was going to happen. The covert narcissists are much smarter about it with how they do it. They posture it in, in the form of care. So they might say, I'm so concerned about, you know, Johnny, or I'm so concerned about Lisa, you know, they're just, they're not, you know, they're coming apart or they're just drinking too much. And I'm just, so worry about them, you know? And so they put it in terms like that so that the rest of the world sees them as caring and concerned and wonderful. And the rest of the world doesn't see them for how evil they can be and how horrible they can be. And they always do things where there's always this sort of uh, way of being able to make it look like they're good people, but that's the coverts. The, the rest of the types of narcissists might start filing, you know, false pleadings or 
saying things about false letters through lawyers or um, things like that. If it's a malignant narcissist, they might even start stalking you, harassing you, saying things that are patently false, like you're a child molester if you're not, or something like that. That's is really where it can get dangerous sometimes. Sometimes it's not that bad if they're not malignant, but they can become possessive. They can become demanding. This is where it, you know, they can become desperate. You see a desperate form of narcissist. But this is where you start to slay. You start to use my slay methodology, strategy, leverage, anticipate, and focus on you. When you build a strong strategy, when you build leverage, when you anticipate what the narcissist is going to do and stay two steps ahead of them, focus on you being offensive and having a winning mindset, you can do this. So that's why I want you to put in the comments, I can slay this. I can slay this because you can. That's how you win. That's how you win so that you can combat them and combat their abusive controlling behavior because, you know, they're going to try to gaslight you. They're going to try to say whatever, and they're going to try to guilt you, and they're going to act and have tantrums. I will tell you that they're going to be the worst right before they're ready to give up. That's how narcissists are. They're just like toddlers having a tantrum on the floor when toddlers are the worst right before they're ready to give up. And that's how narcissists are too. They are the worst right before they are ready to give up. It is time right now to understand the three surprising reasons that narcissists will actually give up. Understand that we can have new beginnings and new futures. First reason that a narcissist will give up is the quest for authentic connection. They actually do want to have authentic connection. They don't know how to do it, but they actually do want that. We all want that, don't we? They may seem invincible in their pursuit of power and admiration, but beneath their self-centered facade lies that deep shame that they have. They have this sense of deep shame. All human beings want to be connected to each other somewhere deep inside. They have this deep craving for authentic connection, just like all of us do, right? So their overt behaviors may scream ah, for attention, but they have this persistent void inside of them, that persistent emptiness inside of them longing, longing for that true love, longing for that acceptance. And so eventually those emotional wounds and those early life experiences will send them on their way. They want to have that. They've got this fragileness inside of them. So for example, despite their grandiose demeanor, some find themselves isolated and misunderstood and they so they jump from one superficial relationship to another seeking validation seeking admiration only to find themselves again feeling unfulfilled feeling empty that's one example another example is when faced with unconditional love when faced with that genuine care of a partner or a friend, a narcissist might experience that profound internal conflict. And on one hand, they crave that connection, but on another hand, their defenses push them away. It's that trauma that, you know, trauma speaks for us a lot of times. You know, our trauma gets in, in the way because our trauma fears that vulnerability, our trauma fears that rejection. So that's number one. Number two, is confronting the mask, confronting that mask. By the way, I have a whole video on what happens with a covert narcissist when that mask falls off. And I definitely recommend that you check out that video and what happens when that mask comes flying off of their, their face. Attention to all of you who have ever felt trapped by a narcissist. Are you struggling in a relationship with a narcissist? and feeling powerless or paranoid and not sure what to do, it is time to take back control and flip the script on their game. 
I want to introduce to you the ultimate solution to breaking free from the grip of narcissistic manipulation. Join me for a groundbreaking webinar called The Three Must-Have Secrets to Communicating with a Narcissist. Hi, my name is Rebecca Zung, and I've been recognized by U.S. News as one of the best lawyers in America, and I'm a globally recognized narcissist negotiation expert, and I've spent years studying and mastering the art of negotiating with narcissists. I know firsthand the devastation these relationships can cause, but I also know the key to regaining your power, and I know how to shift the dynamic with these high conflict personalities. In this exclusive webinar, you will discover the three essential secrets to go from feeling paralyzed and feeling like a victim to becoming victorious. This isn't just theory. These are proven techniques that I have used to help literally thousands of people go from feeling powerless to feeling victorious and actually breaking free from the grip of narcissistic control. Hi, my name is Heather, and I have never felt so compelled to give a review as I do now for attorney Rebecca Zung. The strength I had gained and the confidence that I had gained from Rebecca actually allowed me to get a different self-worth and presence in myself. And due to that, I was actually able to pick myself up within, made tremendous difference. And, you know, she has literally changed the situation for me and mostly given me a sense of presence, strength, self-confidence and well-being that um, I'm just so grateful for her. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Vitale. I know Rebecca Zung. She interviewed me, but I'm also aware of all of her products. What she's doing is saving people who are going through the dark night of the soul. This can be the turning point for you. Don't let that narcissist have that grip on your life any longer. It's time to rewrite your history and take charge of your future and unlock that power within you. Sign up now for three must-have secrets to communicating with narcissists and embark on a transformational journey toward your freedom, toward your empowerment. Break free from the grasp of that narcissist and create the life that you deserve. Join me, attorney Rebecca Zung, narcissist negotiation expert, and let's rewrite your narrative together. Register now at slay.rebeccazung.com and let's take the first step toward your life of victory. We often encounter the narcissist's carefully crafted mask which shields their fragile ego from the world. What happens when that mask is beginning to crack, that fragile ego is you know, struggling. They, they struggle with that. It becomes overwhelming for them. They, they have to look at their insecurities at that point. Remember that mask is their shield and it protects that vulnerable core that's deep down inside of them. Underneath there is, is that fear of rejection. They're maintaining this facade and, and that takes a tremendous amount of energy. That, that's why they need this constant validation. And it's it's extremely exhausting. And so, you know, at some point they, they just go, you know what, it's too much. It just takes too much time. It takes too much energy. I might as well just go on to the next source of supply at, at this point because it's easier to just get somebody else who's not going to see what's going on over here. So that's another reason that they might just go ahead and give up. Let me just go find somebody else who is not going to see what's going on under here. And I'll just go to somebody who will just look at the facade. You know, some narcissists might experience moments of self-doubt when they encounter people that they genuinely respect and admire. And in those rare instances, they might drop their guard and, and allow their true selves to be to surface 
momentarily. And by the way, I have a whole video on th this is the only way to get a narcissist respect. Definitely recommend that video as well. So, and, and by the way, if you are dealing with a narcissist, it takes so much energy out of you. They suck the life out of you. I highly recommend that you make sure that you get the support and help that you need. Join my free private Facebook group if you haven't already, which is Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. And, you know, if you don't have access to therapy, I have a sponsor on this channel, which is BetterHelp. And you can get that at betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. And it is a sponsor for us. So that means that we get paid commissions on that. It doesn't cost you any extra. We just want you to have access to the help and support that you need. Reason number three that a narcissist will give up, a surprising reason that a narcissist might give up is the catalyst of empathy. Empathy has the power to ignite profound transformation even within the most deeply entrenched narcissist. So when they're exposed to genuine empathy and compassion, a narcissist rigid mechanisms may crumble, revealing their wounded soul and opening the door to healing and growth. You know, narcissists often struggle with is recognizing and understanding emotions in themselves and others. And genuine empathy can often serve as a mirror reflecting their suppressed pain and emotional needs, ultimately paving a way for positive change. Now, I don't recommend this during negotiations. Because, you know, if you try to do this during negotiations, they're still just going to see you as the enemy. During negotiations, you have to have a certain boundary because you're either for them or against them. And if you're against them, then you're definitely public enemy number one. So, you know, you have to use kind of what I call ethically manipulating the manipulator. So you've got to fluff or favor or vomit later, you know, but you can do it in a, in a certain way, knowing that you're doing it to get what you want. You know, that's what I kind of say. Sometimes it works where you kind of maybe decoy them, letting them think that you're wanting certain things, but that's not actually what you want. Throw them off the scent of what you actually want because if they think you want a certain thing, then they're going to definitely want to make sure that you don't get that thing. But, you know, you can maybe do it in that sort of way because they're not necessarily self-aware. But don't allow them to trigger you. Don't allow them to trigger you. Understanding that that is what you're dealing with when you're dealing with a narcissist and show them, some, you know, maybe some kind of empathy. But don't, don't allow them to trigger you. Make sure that you don't allow them to trigger you and have a certain boundary, making sure that you always keep your boundaries in place and, and keep your own self-healing paramount when you're dealing with this. Keep your own self-healing paramount and first and foremost. You know, I have a whole video on dealing with a narcissist and I definitely recommend that you check out that video as well. Talk about this narcissist and how it kind of opened doors that maybe you hadn't really seen right in front of you. Yes. I had really reached, you know, this pinnacle of success and thought, I mean, to the point that other lawyers had called the guy that I was merging my practice with and thought and asked if I had cancer like like why would she walk away from this size of a practice like I was literally you know at the top of my game and yep. so I got into this business endeavor with this woman who was you know it's one thing to advocate on behalf of others but when you are in for me in a partnership with someone who's supposed to be your equal of uh, and it was a female and and this person turned out to be what I didn't have the uh, language for at the time a covert passive aggressive narcissist everybody thought she was so nice and she was very charming. And, you know, I didn't speak up 
when I saw things happening. I didn't, I didn't, I felt, I, I was transported back to when I had been bullied as a kid. And I had lived mm. this whole life already, very successful. I thought I had processed all of these emotions from when I had been bullied as a kid for being Asian. You know, here I'd had this whole big life back in Naples, Florida, where I was on top of my game. I had a lot of friends. I had, you know, I was married. I made my daughter, you know, like my life was good, you know. And I had, you know, mind you, I gotten married when I was 19. I had um, my the first time. I had three kids by the time I was 22. I had, because I had dropped out of college, I went back to law school at night and had met my second husband, who I'm still married to now, when I was still in my 20s. I had gone back to um, University of Miami and gone to night school and went to law school 100% on student loans. And so I had literally gotten out of the trenches, you know, and built this law practice, you know, so I had come up from the ranks. And so, you know, I really felt like I was on top of my game. And when this happened, I really was very stymied at this point, I, I, confused. I was thinking about it in the middle of the night, ruminating about it, obsessing about it, brushing my teeth in the morning, obsessing about it, talking to my husband, talking to my friends, you know, it, it, walking around my house, you know, I, I, it just was so feeling this pit in my stomach constantly about this situation. And, but not sure what was going on in my life at that time. And it really threw me for a loop. Really threw me for so a loop. So what did you do? Because there was a, a turn of events with this. What, how yeah. did this situation lead you into what you're doing today and what you're now known for? Yeah. So I ended up going on vac vacation and it was only in July of 2019. So we're not talking about all that long ago. I remember going on vacation with my husband and my daughter and we were in Hawaii. And we went up to the top of a mountain in Mount Haleakala, which I don't know if you've ever done that, but you get up in the morning, yep. you go to sunrise and it's so beautiful. It's literally like heaven on earth. And my, my daughter, it's like 2.30 in the morning. It's like you go from like 90 degrees to like 30 degrees, and, but it's beautiful. I mean, literally stunning. And my daughter, who was 17 at the time, she says, Mom, oh my gosh, it's beautiful. It's heaven on earth. And I'm up there with the people I love. And my daughter says this, and, and I said, yeah, it is. It's gorgeous. It's heaven on earth. And all I could think about was this narcissistic person. And I thought, no, 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 no. You do not get to be here. You do not get to be here in heaven on earth. And that was that. The person who walked up that mountain was not the same person who walked down. I literally made a decision in that moment that I was done. And I realized in that moment I was being a victim. And I was allow every moment that I gave that person, I was allowing myself to be a victim. And I made a decision in that moment, I was getting out of that partnership. And as soon as I got back from vacation, I told her I was done. And I told, I, you know, I, I was gonna make it, you know, amicable, but of course she couldn't do that. But that's a whole other thing. But I decided I was going to finish my book, Negotiate Like You Matter which I sent it out for endorsements and I didn't even know Robert Shapiro, but 
he immediately emails me back and says, call me. And I was like, well, okay. So I called him <laughs> and he says, he offers to write the foreword for the book. So like magic starts to happen. And during that time, I was teaching myself the YouTube algorithms and I started following Russell Brunson and I was learning about funnels and things like that. And so I started to do some YouTube videos. I thought I would do negotiation in general. And I started making videos on like clothing color psychology and how to get a job and things like that. I was getting like 30 views on YouTube, like nothing much. And at the same time, I'm somebody told me about narcissism and this person had been a covert passive aggressive narcissist and i thought what is that i never even heard yeah. that term before and so i'm voraciously learning everything i can about narcissism not for anything other than for myself but then i was still practicing law part-time so i was still flying back to florida a week a month from la so I started applying what I was learning about narcissism to my cases. And lo and behold, it's like I discovered penicillin. All of a sudden, I start seeing movement in these people. And I thought, oh my God, I'm totally onto something. So in January of 2020, I do one video on how to negotiate with a narcissist. I had 300 subscribers on my YouTube channel at that point, and I got 700 views on that video. I thought, oh, okay, I'm totally on to something here. So I decided to create a course called Slay Your Negotiation with a Narcissist, and I came up with this acronym SLAY, Strategy, yeah. Leverage, Anticipate, and You. I decide, let me see if I can get the intellectual property on the word slay, which I was able to do. So I own that word. And I decide I'm going to go live with this course on March 11th, which I had no idea what's going to happen in the world at this point. <laughs> yeah. And I do. I go live with it on March 11th. And I, I, I came up with this webinar, Three Must Have Secrets to Communicating with a Narcissist which, by the way, is still my evergreen webinar. Love. And uh, by January of 2021, I had uh, over 100,000 subscribers on my channel. I know that for sure. And I had made $1.1 million on that course. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So yeah. let's talk about this. Cause one thing I love about your story, Rebecca, is like you were learning all of these pieces of the puzzle, but we weren't quite sure exactly how they were all going to fit together. Right. You're learning YouTube algorithms. You're learning funnels. You're learning about digital courses. You're learning about all these things. And isn't it interesting to think too, that you could have gone with an entirely different lens, hit a totally different market or no market at all. And how you kind of uncovered like, wait, this is getting traction. This is proof people are interested. This is where I can go. Walk me through what it's been like since you published that first video on YouTube, saw that traction. Did you go hard? Did you go deep? Like, how did you kind of let that, like let the people speak of what they're most curious about and help that guide your next steps? Well, it wasn't so easy, frankly, because at first no. when I saw that hit I thought oh, I don't know if I want to be the narcissism queen frankly yeah yeah it wasn't so easy for me because I wasn't when I saw that first one hit I thought okay I definitely need to make more content around that but then I thought I don't know if I really want to be the narcissism queen you know like <laughs> it, it wasn't right. like I really wanted to be negotiation. Like that was sort of where I wanted to go. But then I thought, well, let me just make eight videos on this. And I had talked to my brother who, my brother was one of the founding executives of a company called DoubleClick, which is a, uh, was, was a di digital course. I mean, uh, sorry, a digital um, um, company, which it was originally, um, 
uh, purchased by Google a long time ago. Um, and so he was like, you know, just ride the wave, you know? I mean, he he just he he just thought ride the wave. And at the time, he was um, in, a, in the middle of a messy divorce, and you know. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll just do this for a little while and just see how it goes, you know. So, and it was really, honestly, when I started. Oh, I, the other piece of it, frankly, was I wasn't really ready to talk about my experience with having been in, in that relationship because I thought, how did I end up there? Yeah. It was yeah. kind of shameful for me. Uh, and, I, you know, yeah, because I thought I'm supposed to be strong. I was supposed to be this badass attorney. How did I end up there? And then I thought, I need to get over this blame and shame, and I needed to really let people know that they don't attach themselves to you because you have so little value. They attach themselves to you because you have so much. And mm. they're really good at what they do. You know, they're good at mirroring you. They're good at love bombing you. And, they're, you know, and it's not just a romantic relationship. It's business relationships. It's all kinds of relationships. So I wanted to let people know that it could be anybody, you know? And, and the more authentic and vulnerable I got, the more traction I got. You know, and, and mm -hmm. I, I couldn't be anybody but myself because, you know, I am, I try, I, I, at least I try to be the same, you know, here and here and here, you know, I, I, I want to believe that I'm the same if we're having coffee or if we're having this conversation, you know, on a podcast, right? And so I yeah. wanted people to know that it can, it can happen to anybody. And the more I did that, the more views I started to get and the more people I started to help. What did it feel like going from that like very powerful position as a lawyer to this more like vulnerable, authentic person? You're you're no longer necessarily representing other people in their stories. You're telling right. your story. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, that is so hard. I know so many entrepreneurs who just want to hide behind their work, right? Where it's like, look, but don't look too close. But I do think that you touched on something, that authenticity and that vulnerability is what connects human to human. And the fact that you are this strong, powerful women, woman and this still happened to you is a sign that it, again, can happen to anyone and it likely is. And so what did it feel like kind of putting on that new identity of like, okay, I can be me and I can tell my story and it can be received? How was that experience? It was hard. At first, it yeah. was really hard. I, I mean, honestly, I, I, you know, but the more emails and, and messages that I yeah. got, the easier that it got because I truly get, I, I mean, now it, it's thousands, but it, they come in every single day, literally every day. I have a full team now of VAs that answer my emails and texts and DMs that it's literally full time of people whose lives we touch. And my head of sales actually, she made the point that the people whose lives that we're changing, it's not just them, it's generational. Mm -hmm. And when she said that, mm -hmm. I literally got chills down to my core. Shopify helps millions sell billions around the world through their digital courses, through their digital products, at the touch of a button, on their smartphones, on social media, however they want, including me at shop.rebeccazung.com. You can access your store from all over the world, just the touch of a button from your smartphones, start accepting payments. Everything you need to sell online, manage orders and develop relationships in one place and look fabulous doing it. 
Shopify is the commerce platform that is revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide, including my own at shop.rebeccazung.com. So right now, what you need to do is sign up for a $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash best life, all lowercase, go to shopify.com slash best life to take your retail business to the next level today, shopify.com slash best life.